Let us pray for the illumination of God's word. Our loving Heavenly Father, in praise and gratitude for your saving grace and transforming love, we lift our hearts to you this morning. Grace saves us. Love blesses us. Our lives have meaning in your service. Thank you. We pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus, our resurrected Lord and only Savior. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is from the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Listen now for the word of God. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and in his love is perfected in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You know, I don't know who's in the better position today. Those of you who can remember back 30 years ago when I served this church, Wayne Peter and I were talking and said there, there's some things way back there that we sort of get cobwebs on, and that's good sometimes. Uh, or are those of you who have come to Bethpage more recently than 30 years ago uh, not sure who's in the better position today, but that's really not what's important today uh, because what I want to talk to you about today is what's most important about living in the world we live in today. I really was excited when I found the passage from Mark was a lectionary passage of Scripture, and it has been my tradition to try to preach from the lectionary passage because I see something uh, in that passage that, that speaks to me that I hope can speak to us when we come together and open our hearts and minds to it. I love preaching from Paul's letter to Romans. It just talks about life. And John 3.16 uh, is, of course, the most memorable of verses to us. But this text from Mark, to me, it's one of the most pivotal in the whole of the New Testament. And I think it sums up in a very basic way the message of what God was trying to get across to us in Jesus Christ. So let's listen for God's word to us from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 28th verse. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said, he is one, and beside him is there no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any questions. This is the Lord of the Lord. Thank you, 
We're going to get through this today, okay? I see faces that I haven't seen in a long time, uh, and it's good to see you. It's good to be here. Uh, Jane and I both are very just humbled that your pastor, Ellen, uh, invited me to come and be with you today. Uh, but I've got a question to ask you. How many of you watch Wheel of Fortune? Anybody watch Wheel of Fortune here? I'm in trouble if nobody watches Wheel of Fortune. Okay. All right. We got some. We got some Wheel of Fortune ad, ad devotees here. Well, as my wife will tell you, there are very few things that keep me away from the TV set at 7 p.m. on a weekday night uh, to sit down and watch Wheel. And I am here to tell you, it has nothing to do with Vanna. <laughs> promise you. Promise you. But it helps keeps my brain cells working to try to solve these puzzles. Uh, and, and I know the contestants can't hear me when I shout out the answers to them, but I still think, come on, get it. I got it. Why can't you get it? Well, I, I, well, I mention this because I just ran across something a week or two ago that talked about an event that happened on Wheel of Fortune about three years ago. Uh, perhaps you saw that show. It was a show where they had some former military personnel on the show, uh, three as usual, uh, and, and one of them was doing quite well, a lady, uh, Nora Fontana was her name, uh, and it came to the last puzzle as they were guessing letters to go into that puzzle, and she started saying X, Y, Z, or I don't, I can't think of a letter. And someone else ended up winning the puzzle of that round. And when she had actually won more than anybody else, and so she was going to the bonus round, and Pat Sajak came over to her and said, why did you ask for those letters? And she said, well, it just was what came to mind. Uh, but later, the truth came out. That night, up to that point, she was the only one of the three who had won any money. And her thought was to give somebody else a chance to have some success like she had had. And so she purposefully gave letters that she didn't think would be in the puzzle to give somebody else a chance to win, rather than wanting everything for herself. Now I tell you this story because I would suggest that this lady had some sense of what's most important, like our text for today. What's most important? The text, the context of this is, is telling because it's observed that the scribes saw that they were disputing one another with one another. The Sadducees and the Pharisees loved to get into extended debates over the concept of resurrection. And they were trying to, to catch Jesus in the middle of their debate and to try to get him to take sides with one or the other in that debate. Jesus would not be caught in the middle. And the scribe observing this said, maybe this man is one worth asking an important question. So he asked them, sir, which commandment is first of all? In other words, what's most important? And Jesus responded with what we know as the great commandment. The Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe knows that he's quoting from Deuteronomy and Leviticus Hebrew scriptures. Now, he said, what's his first? But doesn't it sound like he said three things? Love, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, let's, let's look at this a little bit to see if we can understand it. You see, the first commandment to love God. Love God intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, intimately. Jesus is not interested in getting bogged down in rules and regulations 
rituals and rites, he cuts to the heart of the matter, no pun intended, and this probably caught the scribe's attention. The point, love God, love others. Over my 45 years in ministry, I've been in various contexts with churches and with presbyteries, and regrettably, I have seen times when in meetings at the local level, regional level, national level, we get bogged down in what I call majoring in minors. We get into debating the fine points of something, and we can go on for hours uh, debating something and sometimes arguing with one another about it. But what he says is love God, love one another. That's what it's all about. And the good news is I've seen other times in churches and in regional bodies of the Presbyterian Church where we have risen above that and have recognized what it is to love God and what it is to love others. And that's the good news for me. Jesus is clear about where we ought to concentrate our time and energy. Over and over again in the Gospels, he makes the point, right ritual cannot take the place of acting out of a loving relationship. And the scribe acknowledges this, saying, this is more important than burnt offerings and whole offerings and sacrifices. It's not the rituals of faith and rules are unimportant. They're just not as important as love of God and love of neighbor. Now, if you go into this and you go back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus, to Deuteronomy in particular, you see that there's one phrase in that love of God, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your mind is not in that passage from Deuteronomy. But Jesus adds it in the list of things for which we are called to love God. I like this because it contradicts the notion that faith in God is incompatible with full use of our minds. In fact, it's one of our traditions, in our Reformed tradition, it's one of our cardinal beliefs to recognize the life of the mind in the service of God. See, that's why I watch William. is to use my mind, to leave it working a little bit. Jesus is clear that this is more than an intellectual exercise. Now, it's been about 20 years ago now when I was really feeling very spiritually dry, and I discovered and got involved in a program called the Spiritual Small Group Leadership Program of Shalane Institute out of Bethesda, Maryland. The director of that program was an Episcopal priest by the name of Tilden Edwards, and we came together over two years uh, in this richly ecumenical group of 30 people from all over the country, all denominations, and one of Tilden Edwards' phrases that he kept repeating to us was, get in touch with your desire for God. Now, I had been to Union Seminary in Richmond. I had studied the Old Testament. I had studied Hebrew and Greek and all those kinds of things. But this getting in touch with desire for God, it just wasn't in one of my seminary courses. And so after, you know, him continuing to harp on this idea of getting in touch with your desire for God, I just piped up one day uh, in the group and I said, Tilden, I'm sick and tired about hearing about this getting in touch with your desire for God. I didn't study that in seminary. What, 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 what's that all about? He said, he smiled, spoke very gently. He said, Kendall, perhaps you might spend some time exploring that for yourself. Ah, oh, teachers. And I did. And in my continuing studies in spiritual direction, uh, later I came across a book by a Roman Catholic nun, Maureen Conroy, who had a book, Looking Into the Well. And it basically talked about going deeper into our relationship to God and plumbing the depths of that experience in our innermost being. The Great Commandment speaks of the challenge we have to open our lives to God and to know God's love for us and to grow in responding to that love in ever-deepening ways. And then we come to another part of this great commandment, the, the second part, or, or actually, you know, if you look at it, 
Is there one, are there two, are there three? Because he says, next, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, what's important? I think you can get the idea that, that this one really has a twofold dimension to it too. Now, as I mentioned, as I've grown in this study in spiritual direction, I got introduced to something called contemplative prayer. And perhaps you've heard something about it. Again, in seminary, we were taught about prayer. I mean, the way you do a prayer is there's five parts to a prayer. There's praise, thanksgiving, uh, and intercession, confession, and supplication. That's what a prayer is supposed to have. Uh, listen for the prayer that I'm going to pray later and see if it has these five components, praise, thanksgiving, uh, and supplication, and intercession. Uh, that's what we were taught to do in seminary, to prepare ahead and have this done read with sincerity and integrity when it came time for prayer and corporate worship. This idea of contemplative prayer introduced me to a whole different way of praying starting with the idea of opening myself to God and listening for God. I follow Thomas Keating's capsule list the best way I've come to understand it's in four components. Opening to God, letting go of control, being gentle to myself, and being gentle to others. Now, it's important to note the order on this. Opening ourselves to God. You know, we, we're busy people these days. We have a hurried and a harried lifestyle. Uh, got more to do than tw- can be done in 24 hours. And I don't know about you, but when I sit down and try to pray, what sort of comes to my mind is my whole to-do list for the day. Or all the things that I didn't get done. Or what I should do. Or who I should see. Or what I should say. And all those things just sort of come flooding in. And I think that's human nature. And that's the reason the invitation is to take time to rest into prayer, to sort of, okay, got that, now let go of it. Another one, okay, got that, let go of it. And then just gradually go into an area of being in the presence of God. I think that's an important step in prayer. And letting go of control, now that's a piece of cake, right? I mean, we just say, sure. Not so. Uh, We like to be in control of things, don't we? We like to be in control of our lives, our jobs, our families, everything in general. But the longer we live, and I'm, I'm getting there little by little, the longer we live, the more we're open to recognize it, we discover there is much about life that we can't control. Go back April 1988, those of you who can remember. Jane woke me up at three o'clock in the morning. We gotta go to the hospital, I'm sick. The next seven hours, she was in surgery. We didn't know what was gonna happen. Seven of you met me out in the waiting room after I came back from taking the kids to school saying, where have you been? Three weeks in intensive care. Three more weeks in the hospital. She's here to see us and talk with us today. I didn't have control over that. Surgeon, maybe some, but not completely. That was by the grace of God. And the beginning of wisdom is acknowledging and recognizing who's in control. And who's in control? The good, loving, gracious God. You know, I, I, I've told recently, I'm, I'm in the process of being received into the membership of Western Carolina Presbytery, and, and, they, and they, I had to meet with the examinations committee, uh, and they asked me, you know, what does Christian grace mean to you? And I said, well... And I told him about this. Uh, and I said, as I was going back to the hospital one day while Jane was in intensive care, uh, I had dropped the kids off at school and I'm on the way back to the hospital and I'm having this conversation with God in the car. And I'm saying, God, let's talk, you and me. Do you really want me to be responsible for raising these two boys by myself? 
thanks be to God. God's up there saying, oh my God, no. <laughs> thanks be to God. Uh, Contemplative prayer really became meaningful to me uh, as we saw this invitation to gentleness that's being talked about. And you know, what I've discovered is, is part of this invitation to gentleness is we can't be gentle to others until we've learned how to be gentle to ourselves. And, and I, I, in, in researching for this sermon, I, I discovered that actually John Calvin and Barr, two uh, noted people in our tradition, didn't like the idea of talking about loving the self. They thought that was contrary to uh, our faith. Or I would think if we take it seriously, we can understand that we can't love others until we've learned how to love ourselves. And I think really we go in one of two directions on this. We, we pick up on that Calvinistic and Augustan notion of total depravity, that we are just total sinners uh, uh, hanging by a slender thread, as Jonathan Edwards said. Uh, and we sort of put into our souls this so low self-image and a minimalist attitude towards what we're able to be and do. Or we go the other direction and we say, I am God's gift to humanity. Do what I say. Do what I do. Or else. One way or the other, it seems like, we, in, in various points in our times, we go one of those two directions about the idea of how we think of ourselves. And, and I would say that both of them are really related to an idea of low self-image. One, to diminish the self. The other, to protect and defend the self. I am pleased. Over the years, I've met with many, though, many people who are preparing to uh, be ordained as Presbyterian ministers. And in that process, we asked them, what led you to the Presbyterian church? And it really pleases me that more often than not, they say the concept of Christian grace. I didn't deserve it, but God gave me grace by Christ. That's what attracted them to the Presbyterian church. I, I'm pleased to hear that from people considering ministry. We owe Martin Luther a debt of gratitude for that. But also Ignatius of Loyola talked about this. He said, all things in the world are created because of God's love, and they become uh, a context of gifts presented to us that we can know God more easily and make return of love more readily. We can't learn how to be gentle, how to love others, until we've discovered the love of God for us that opens the way for us to love others in response to God's love for us. Okay, this, this text from Mark. Long-running battle over views of the resurrection. Trying to trap Jesus into taking sides. And Jesus responded, you're missing the point. What's really important, when all said and done, is to love God and to love your neighbor. Our sense of doing the loving thing is probably not going to be the same all the time. In fact, we're going to look at things differently and we're going to approach things differently. That's part of life. That's part of who we are as humans. But one person wrote of this. For many of us in the contemporary world, love of neighbor coincides with respect for our neighbor's belief system or lack thereof. But this respect for our neighbor by this respect for our neighbor, we carry out the mission of human dignity, which in turn represents the love of God, of Jesus. Over the years, I've seen a lot of experiences, as I mentioned, when churches, presbyteries, they get divided in struggles, either related to a pastor or a group within a church or some issue before the church. And these kinds of situations remind us again that we have more to work on in our task of practicing the love of God and the love of others. These things grieve me deeply. In fact, you look around and today, you can see this epidemic attitude in our culture that everybody's looking for somebody else to blame or avoid personal responsibility for solving problems in a constructive way. How do we rise above this? this spirit of pettiness and strife that's so epidemic. 
I think it's in recognizing what's most important, like Nura Fontana did on Wheel of Fortune that night. A few years ago, I was in a meeting. Joan Gray, former moderator of the General Assembly, was speaking. She had picked up on this in a little bit different way, uh, looking at the 15th chapter of John, and there Jesus said, my commandment to you is to love one another as I have loved you. And I love the way she, she talked about this. She said, as pastors, we all know people who are easy to love. They drop by the church office and drop off some cookies for us unexpectedly. They drop by and they see us suffering from a cold or sinus infection or something like that. They say, go home. Or she said, you know, once when I was visiting someone who was near death before leaving on vacation, that person sat me down and said, swear to me you will not come back for my funeral. Those are the easy people to love. But John Gray said there's other folks that we deal with in the church, people who are hard to love. Those who make a snide comment at every session meeting. Those who withhold their pledge because they're unhappy with the sermon we preach. She said some people seem impossible to love. But Jesus said love one another. And she said, you know, this is humanly impossible. Sometimes she said, you know, I sit and, and I'm talking with Jesus and said, why are you asking us to do this, Lord? And the answer is because I'm Jesus. And then she summed it up this way. In the struggle to love beyond what is humanly possible, we participate in the struggle of the church love beyond what's humanly possible is participation in the life of the Godhead. It's a witness to a broken world. God, our, our world needs it so badly today. I need it so badly today. We need it so badly today. I'm with John. It's most important. Let us pray. Holy God, you know, we are a broken people. We are a willful people, but we're your people. Help us to be the people that you call us to be in Christ. Amen.